So now let's see a couple of key features of the workforce state before we zooming in into the Hungarian situation. As was already mentioned uh, in the introductory part, I'm not going to describe the, the nature of the welfare state and how workfare state back in the 1960s has been emerged basically as, um, as an idea against the well-settled workfare states in uh, the US, in, in partly in the USA, but mainly in Western Europe. But what I'm just going to do is just giving a couple of uh, background information about the, the history of the workfare state and also before we uh, move into the 20th and 21st century, most probably is important to see a couple of background features, historical features of the Middle Ages. Because very often when um, in public speeches we are hear about the workfare state as such or, or workfare programs as such, there are preconditions in the ordinary people mindset or prejudice in our mindset and then very often we are misinterpreting what we are hearing and not making clear distinction between the so-called workhouse movement or poor house movement and the modern uh, workfare uh, programs. Obviously, in many countries, uh, mainly in Central Europe or uh, in the former Soviet Union countries uh, or in Asia and so on, we very often can observe programs which be named as workfare programs, but in their natures, I would say they are probably closer to the Middle Ages workhouses movements. So let's see a couple of uh, facts and figures about the, the workhouses. As you can see in this slide, and the picture is coming from the Twist Oliver, very famous novel, uh, which is, I think, a, a global reference uh, to, the, to the workhouses. It, it came to alive in the uh, basically 14th century uh, Europe. Obviously, when there were poor people around in smaller cities, urbanization hasn't started that time, and then nobody was able or willing to take care of these people. There was a need in the society to get them away from the streets, so no, no begging and no this type of disturbing issues could happen uh, in the cities. And the other understanding of the workhouse movement was, and I think in this case, although I'm not a specialist in the English history, there were no big differences between the, the English meaning of workhouses and the continental one, which as you can see, uh, was emerged slightly later, coming from uh, Amsterdam, 15th century, and then was spread around the German-speaking countries, including Hungary later on, which was under the Austrian, or, the, or at that time, even the Habsburg uh, Empire. Um, so what was this aim? This aim was basically using the workhouses as a uh, as a small crime punishment places. So instead of putting people to jail, which can be very expensive, they also use the workhouses for these cases, which means that in the modern ages, when we are addressing the workhouse movement, there is a double understanding. So we can understand the workhouses as poor houses, but also sometimes we are understanding uh, workfare and the workhouses like um, some type of uh, small crime punishment uh, tool. And still, if we are observing or evaluating modern structures, legal structures, very often when we are spotting this word in legislation, it has a double meaning or unclear meaning. Even I would say my, 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 my 
hypothesis would be that if we are asking ordinary people about the real nature of uh, the workhouse movements, they would aim or they would name both of these uh, reasons. So as I said earlier that uh, in Hungary, which was that time under the, the Habsburg Empire, uh, the workhouse movement arrived slightly later, like everybody, uh, like everything else, usually arrives slightly later uh, to uh, the Habsburg Empire than was emerged in England or in, in the uh, French-speaking or or Dutch-speaking territories of Europe that time. Under Maria Theresia, the first uh, workhouse was established in Sens, which is uh, actually at the moment is uh, just in the suburb of Pozsony, which is Bratislava, so in current years is part of Slovakia. And then later this was moved to Seged, another Hungarian city in the south. But what is more important than all these small details that the workhouse movement uh, became alive also in uh, in the Hungarian kingdom. And how we are still living with history, I just also put it in this slide, the, the map of Budapest or the part of the map of Budapest, and you can see that uh, Dolokhaz, Dolokhaz in Hungarian basically means workhouse, is even a name of the street currently in Budapest. And accidentally, this street is very close to the the college itself. So once you are probably in Budapest, then you would have a good chance to, to visit it. So that's, that's something which is already in the past, but when we are talking about modern workfare programs and states which have been transferred to modern workfare states, these background informations play a crucial part. So how we can understand the modern workfare states and the, as you will realize there are a couple of uh, video clips uh, attached to this presentation which also means that I'm not really going to describe the content of these presentations but these will be available in the course or under the course so please just check these out later on. Uh, so first of all if we are zooming into the 20th century, then the modern workfare uh, programs as ideas has been emerged in the in the 60s, late 60s, and there was a famous uh, television speech of Nixon, who was a president of the USA at that time, when he was declaring that the workfare programs are essential and and important. Workfare, on the other hand, in the so-called uh, state communist countries in the Soviet Union and also in Hungary in the 20th, uh, 20th century were part of the official ideology of these countries. So as Hungary was part of the communist bloc before 1990, obviously we had a different history than Western Europe had. Officially, as you will see in the second part of uh, this uh, presentation, officially in Hungary, until the late 1980s, there was no unemployment. So which means that unemployment does not exist and you have no citizens who are hanging around in the streets, begging or doing something else, which is not acceptable according to state rules. So at least in the official level, you are not facing with this type of problems. Unofficially, that was another story, and obviously there were always people without work, or there were people formerly employed, but in real terms, uh, we would declare them in modern terms as unemployed. So already there are different type of understanding of, of workfare programs and then our current understanding always based on our history. So without the historical lessons being learned, it's very hard to understand what is actually happening in certain countries and why these type of movements, political movements are so strong or even became mainstream elements. So in the case of Hungary and the case of uh, several uh, Central Eastern European countries, 
former uh, state communist countries. Obviously, there is a strong nostalgia against uh, the the workfare state on that on that sense how it was understood in the in the communist years. So basically, no unemployment at all, and it has nothing to do with with punishment. But as we are observing already, this is at least two different layers. So when we are saying that. Um, how the work uh, houses movement was understood uh, uh, before the modern capitalist has started in Europe and how we uh, understood the workfare as such during the state, co state communist time are two very different type of nature of the workfare states. And then I will giving you an, a third uh, definition very soon. Okay, these are also videos, then you can watch them later on. So when we are trying to argue that workfare is a way how we can deal with social policy, obviously there are several uh, cases and statements, uh, as you can see in these slides, coming from two very different presidents of the USA, uh, representing very different political views about society and then uh, social policy, but both of them declare that social, uh, that uh, workfare programs is, as part of social policy are understandable and are useful. Again, how the two different presidents understood the role of workfare in a society, the workfare programs in a society, were very different and still are very different. Uh, but I Again, we'll give you more details about this very soon. And on the other hand, there are uh, when there are pros, there are obviously cons. Why we are saying that the workfare is uh, is not a solution currently in the 21st century, in the last uh, couple of uh, years or decades. There is a strong movement of the unconditional uh, social benefits or unconditional basic income, which I'm not going to address in this presentation, but it's a, it's a huge, provocating a huge debate about uh, workfare and, and social uh, welfare systems as such. Again, here I added a short video, so what I'm just asking that after my presentation, please watch all of these very carefully and then you will have a, a stronger understanding why some of the uh, some of the researchers some of the evaluators are pro uh, workfare and then why others are against these type of uh, policies okay so then if you are talking about workfare i think it's also very relevant to try to provide a definition. So this is a definition what we are going to use in the second part of the course when we are going to talk about uh, the Hungarian uh, workfare regime at the moment. So basically the workfare means that the different governments, local, national, so on, uh, local authorities even can be government in that sense, are offering certain type of programs for those who are without work but and this is a very important precondition they are able to work and instead of just giving in brackets instead of just giving them social aid or social benefits they have to prove that they are capable to work the proving, pro proving your work capability, employability is a very strong element of the definition of workfare. And once you, are, you prove that you are capable to work, then you can get access to some of the government uh, benefits. Uh, and then there are stronger and weaker uh, programs, workfare programs in that sense. The conditionalities can be uh, quite stick, like we're going to see it is with the, the Hungarian case, or it can be very mild when then people just have to show up for a few weeks training or, or work programs. And then obviously there are several other solutions between these two, uh, <clears throat> two type of approaches. Very often an additional element of the workfare program 
is that it's not only a standalone uh, work for the government or for the local authorities because these these uh, works are usually not being done in the primary market but you but should be uh, under the local authorities or the central government so basically a, an important condition that this, uh, these work opportunities are not touching not destroying the primary market and uh, an additional element of the modern uh, work pro workfare programs uh, are the, the training element. So once you are as a beneficiary eligible for a workfare program, and once you are in, in this program and then you showed your goodwill that you are ready to work, and then you are able to work, so you have some capability to work, then another element of these programs if they are advanced enough that they start providing you some type of training so trying to raise your level of employability why because the idea is that once you are done with the program you will be able to find your way seek for an employment in the primary uh, labor market so one more important element of the workfare programs that these must be understood as temporary solution for those who are not uh, trained enough, not capable enough to be uh, uh, to get hired in the uh, in the primary market. I think these conditions are quite important once we are reviewing uh, workfare programs, especially in the Hungarian case i'm going to talk about in the second part of of this lecture because if if these conditions are not there then we probably would understand the role of the workfare program as something different so not really focusing on employability and engaging more people with the primary uh, market also, there are several different, con uh, different definitions of the workfare state around and workfare programs around the globe. I just picked up a few. So in the Hungarian context, we are usually referring the system since 2011 as a public work scheme to, to, to PWS, which obviously makes a strong distinction from different workfare programs. So this is not already a program, but this is a national policy at the moment. Then there are obviously different type of uh, workfare programs around the globe. And then what is nowadays very fashionable, the so-called dual training, which is uh, having a very strong German continental context but now being expanded even in the UK or US and in other uh, parts of the globe, we start talking about work-based learning and dual training. Uh, again, in a slightly modified way than it was understood in the, in the continental German speaking countries. Here we are not going into details. If you are interested in, probably you can find other courses online which are dealing with these uh, definitions. And uh, one more uh, definition which is important to be mentioned when uh, we are understanding the workfare program or workfare regime as, as a mandatory structure. So where those who are eligible or for the, the program or whose conditions met to get eligible with this program are being gently or not too gently forced to get engaged with the workfare program or when it's not mandatory but it's a free choice of the citizens or the families or the students to get engaged with work experiences. And work experiences, such as the dual training itself, obviously being used in all parts of the globe, very fashionable, very useful solutions. And then we are addressing other issues like bridging the gap between the education system 
especially the vocational education system and the labor market, the current needs of the employers, then work experience programs are part of the solutions. But again, here in this lecture, we are not really addressing these type of programs. Okay, so then what are the real nature of the workfare regimes versus the uh, versus the, the more traditional uh, welfare uh, structures, which obviously not so traditional because all of them were emerged at in the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. So when we are declaring the, the welfare state as something always uh, available structure, this is, this is a very false statement because the welfare state themselves is not really older than a, than a uh, century. So in that sense, uh, relatively new, and then the workhouse movement itself uh, was alive much longer in the European history than the, the modern welfare states are uh, there. So here uh, I'm using PEC structure, and the whole article will be in your depository, so please read the whole article carefully. In this uh, chart, in this structure, he was basically defining the welfare versus workfare states in, uh, in several angles, just picking up a few, and then later on you can read the full article, and please read the full article. Uh, the first item is the different ideologies between the welfareism and workfareism. So the welfare regime is always talking about the needs of the citizen. And based on that, how we can build the safety net, uh, the intervention of social work, and so on and so on. By the same time, in the workfare states or workfare programs, we are talking about work as a value. So very much in the heart of the workfare structure is work as a value itself, which, which itself is very much questionable in the 21st century labor market. When we are talking about precariats, when we are talking about the transitional labor market, so work itself as a standalone value can be very strongly questioned. It has a, st a strong literature. I'm not going to details again in, in, in this presentation. But I think it, it's very important to, to know this issue around the workfare state that the very basic, very first statement of, of the workfare programs are that work, paid work, wage work itself is something which is valuable. And I think this can be very strongly uh, questioned in modern societies. The other issue is, I'm trying to highlight here, that in the uh, welfare regime, the main idea of the, of the development of the system itself or development certain programs is poverty reduction, so making people capable to get engaged in, in higher and better paid jobs and so on and so on and so on. So, uh, some some type of uh, equity is behind all, all of the ideology of the of the welfare state systems. On the other hand, when we are addressing the workfare, the single and standalone approaches, uh, which is obviously connected with the uh, work and the wage work as a value in a society and as a standalone value of the individuals is labor market participation. So again, for example, if we want to understand the steps of the, of the Hungarian government currently or any other governments engaging with workfare regimes, the preconditionality is that whatever is happening in the society itself is not as important as watching the labor market participation data. And we heard many statements of the Hungarian prime minister or other prime ministers uh, when they are saying that we do not care with any other uh, statistical data sets of the national labor market than only watching the labor market participation. 
uh, even even Hungary uh, in back in 2011 declared that that uh, we need to add one million workers uh, wage workers to the Hungarian labor market without any quality criteria. So the only criteria is that wage work is something which is valuable for a society, regardless of the quality of these workplaces or productivity and so on and so on of these workplaces. One more very important uh, feature of the workfare states or workfare programs versus welfare, which will be relevant for us to understand the current Hungarian case, is uh, is the, the way how income is provided to the citizens. So in welfare state, if we are paying passive incomes like uh, like job seekers allowance, unemployment benefit for those wage workers are temporarily losing their jobs, which obviously happening in, in market economies time to time. So that's something which is very normally could happen with any of us. And in this case, because uh, of uh, uh, national uh, uh, structures are there to paying the unemployment benefit based on the fact that you are just a citizen of a certain state or because you are paying social contributions so based on that you are eligible for uh, this type of benefit. Uh, this is very much okay. This is very much the nature of the welfare systems. In workfare systems, this is not take, no, this is not granted as something uh, very much primary understandable or uh, as part of the ordinary business of the system itself. So what you are basically doing, once you are building a workfare state, you start uh, cutting these type of benefits. And every single penny, every single euro, every single Hungarian foreign, so what the government or local authorities are able or willing to pay to the citizens is based on this mean test that you are uh, the one who show the capability you want to work and you are able to work and you want to be a useful uh, part of, of your own society. And that's very strongly an ideology-based approach. And for us, who's basically grew up in, uh, in state socialist systems, uh, it's ahoying the ideology uh, of uh, the socialist systems uh, back in the 1980s or even earlier. Uh, Obviously, there are many other elements of these systems. I'm not, uh, or how we can compare the welfare versus worker system. I'm not going into details because I think this article is perfect. And then once you're going to read the whole article, you will get all of these points uh, in a very clear manner. Okay, but one item I think is very important to get highlighted before we move on to the Hungarian uh, case. The real story behind the welfare, welfare versus workfare regimes. And as economists like to say, there is no free lunch. And then when we are declaring there is no free lunch, this can be super popular among the voters, among, the, among those citizens who's actually not in the situation that they are losing their jobs or they are the beneficiaries of the unemployment uh, uh, structures and so on so on. So it creates a type of political games between political parties and their voters and this is obviously the case in, in every country, every uh, cities, every regions of the globe. That when I'm saying that okay there is no free lunch and also can say that we are not wasting the resources, the budget of the government for those who are not, who's, who should be able to work, but they are not showing their goodwill to contribute to the taxation of the or the, uh, the income generation of the uh, states. So therefore, it became a very uh, popular approach, and then. Obviously, in, in different governments, different structures, there are different way of understanding the, the workfare regimes, but this is one of the reasons why the workfare programs are still and will be so popular in different uh, countries and different uh, nations. 
So thank you for your attention. This was more or less the first part. And then in the second part, we are already coming back with some of the key features of the current uh, Hungarian situation.